logging in, but for time's sake, we'll get started. So good morning. Um, I'm Allison Rosenthal. Thank you everyone for joining us for Cancer Center Grand Rounds today. Um, we have Dr. Poland back to speak with us today, who at this point needs no introduction to this audience. Um, however, um, in case you've missed prior lectures, Dr. Poland has been giving us a crash course in where we stand with COVID vaccinations um, basically quarterly um, for the last six months or so. And, and we found these talks very valuable and had good discussion after. So we've asked him to join us again today um, as our local um, resident internal uh, vaccinologist extraordinaire um, to talk to us a little bit about updates on the COVID-19 variants and where we stand with vaccines. Um, so as always, there is a CME code um, posted here and will be in the chat function at the bottom of the screen as well. And if you have questions or comments, please send them through the question and answer box or the um, chat function. And we'll be happy to get to those at the end of the talk. And with that, I will let you take over Dr. Poland. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Rosenthal. And let me share my screen here and get us going. Um, well, I'm going to speak today on what I entitled uh, COVID-19 virus variants and question, vaccine 2.0. Uh, I will start with the usual disclosures. Um, I basically offer advice to all of the COVID vaccine manufacturers. And the other part of my disclosure is that I will be speaking to you as a fellow physician and scientist. So my comments are going to be stripped of political correctness and economic and political conflicts of interest that have driven so much of irrational human behavior during this pandemic. So we are now in a desperate but unseen and in fact barely noticed race of variant versus vaccine, of ignorance versus knowledge, of disease versus health. To know is science. To believe one knows, absent data, is ignorance. So I'm gonna start with a bit of terminology. Some of you are familiar with looking at this uh, with influenza, for example. So when you see these types of viral terminologies, it refers to an isolate of the virus. So it starts with the genus, beta coronavirus, the city of origin, Wuhan, the isolate number, and the year. Now you hear these terms misused, so I thought it would be worthwhile to define them. Mutation means an actual change in the genomic sequence. So for example, the D to G614 mutation is an aspartic acid to glycine substitution at position 614 of the spike protein. A variant is an isolate whose genomic sequence differs from a reference virus. It may or may not cause any change in the phenotype of the virus. It does not imply a worse or better virus. A viral strain is a variant that does possess unique and stable gen uh, phenotypic characteristics, secondary, usually, to an accumulating number of mutations. You've seen this slide before, but to remind you, because our, our entire discussion will be centered around this. This is the structure of the SARS-CoV-2 positive sense single-stranded RNA virus. <clears throat> the spike or S protein is the primary antigenic determinant. It is, if you look down below, a trimeric protein. So the S protein is a trimeric protein. The, the very tip of this is the receptor binding domain, which binds to the transmembrane ACE2 receptor on host cells. So if you take that genomic structure, kind of stretch it out, we can look at, for example, the S1 subunit, which composes the uh, N terminal domain and the receptor binding domain. And you notice that for the uh, so-called UK or B117 or now alpha variant, um, the South African variant and the Brazilian variant, you see accumulating mutations and deletions. And in fact, you see that a number of these mutations are being held stable from one variant to another. 
So they are accumulating mutations that collectively impact the phenotype of the virus. I did not quite realize it when I published this a year ago and have been the only one to do so, but I wrote an editorial called Tortoises, Hares, and Vaccines, making the point that the race is not always to the swift, and in fact, often to the more thoughtful. Think about it. We would never, ever, with any other RNA virus, produce a vaccine with a single antigen. The reason? RNA viruses have none or, in other cases, limited proofreading ability, allowing for the rapid accumulation of mutations. And when you increase that antigenic distance enough from the primary strain you immunized against, you then create a scenario where you can have immune evasion. And we'll talk about that. So a very brief review of vaccines, just to be sure everybody's at the same starting uh, ground here. So three major types of coronaviruses, at least in the West, protein-based, you're going to see that next month with the Novavax vaccine, viral vectored and mRNA vaccines. While they are different platforms, they all do the same thing. Ultimately, antigen presenting cells of your body are exposed to the S protein and produce uh, immune responses against that. Now, some basic vaccine immunology, just to remind everybody. So we give the viral antigen taken up and activates APCs, which activates naive T cells. That causes differentiation into a CD8 T cell, which helps in viral clearance and T, CD4 T helper cells, which help in activating B cells. B cells themselves differentiate into plasma cells that produce antibody and memory B cells. Note that almost the entire focus has been on this single arm. I've not even outlined the innate immune system here, but has focused on this single arm. And that would be if you will, non-scientific. There are memory B cells and a host of T cell immune responses that will turn out to be important, not just antibody. Antibody is chosen because it's a convenient biomarker with which to determine a correlate of protection. So again, the mRNA vaccines are a very simple idea. They started development in 1960 and in earnest in 1990. So we'll take the latter date to say these vaccines have been in development 30 years. When you hear people say they're new and all these other things, they're essentially wearing a sign on their forehead that says I'm uninformed and ignorant. So this is a simple synthetic genetic blueprint for one protein of the virus, the spike protein gets injected into our muscle cells, taken up by cells into the cytosol of the cell, that, M that mRNA translated by ribosomes into the protein of interest, in this case, the spike protein. Why are they all focused on that? Because we do know that when you produce anti-spike antibody, it binds to spike effectively preventing uh, binding with the transmembrane ACE2 receptor and therefore preventing infection. It works. So let's look at the Pfizer vaccine. These are all full length pre-fusion, stabilized, open conformation um, uh, 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 proteins so that the RBD is exposed. Two doses, three weeks apart, rather onerous storage requirements that have been lessened now. It is a reactogenic vaccine, huge phase three trial, almost 44,000 people. And when you look at these uh, uh, phase three trials, the blue line are people who receive placebo, the orange line people who receive vaccine. If you look at the upper one, you see that by about nine or 10 days, the vaccinees stop accumulating any infections. So you saw the headlines, 
of seven days after two doses of the Pfizer vaccine, uh, point estimate, the point estimate of vaccine efficacy was 95%. Notice the 95% confidence intervals of, I'm just gonna use round numbers, of 90 to almost 98. What that means is there will be people, even in this phase three trial where there were lots of exclusions, who don't respond or don't respond well. Moderna, same idea, two doses, in this case, four weeks apart, reactogenic, a little bit smaller of a study. And we see the same thing in the per protocol analysis, the point estimate of vaccine efficacy was 94%. We see the same phenomena, whether we look at the per protocol or the modified intention to treat analysis, that somewhere in that 10 days or so, we stop seeing the regular accumulation of cases among the vaccinated arm. Now there is some variability, not unexpectedly. Now note that in the phase three trials, as is true for virtually all phase three trials of vaccines, people are immunocompromised on either by disease or treatment, organ transplants, et cetera, were excluded from the trials. So we're looking at, if you will, a very selected population. Real world studies don't show efficacy this high because you're now including people who have an increased propensity to not respond, either by disease or genetic background. So you'll notice, for example, that among people greater than uh, 65 years of age, the point estimate was actually 86%, not 96%, though the 95% confidence intervals overlap. There's some safety issues associated with this and every vaccine local and systemic reactogenicity, anaphylaxis on about the order that we see with other vaccines, a current concern over my, mild myopericarditis in young males, which we are not sure exceeds background rate, and other off-target inflammatory conditions. So we've written an article and published it on a research agenda for better understanding anaphylactic reactions to mRNA. And uh, that, that research proposal is currently sitting in front of CEPI. We also just recently published an article with a variety of collaborators from around the world discussing the critical role of background rates in looking at adverse events. You will hear people say, well, I heard 4,000 people who got the vaccine in a nursing home died. That may very well be true, but you need the follow-up point. 6,000 nursing home patients who didn't get the vaccine died. So you always have to look at background rates in order to understand whether what you're seeing has any causal, potential causal relationship with vaccine. Again, temporality is not causality. It merely provides a hypothesis. There's some unknowns. We don't know the safety profile yet of repeated administration. Is it possible we could see issues of original antigenic sin with variant boosters? We don't yet know durability, though we're gonna talk about that as well as T cell responses. And we don't know by definition what the efficacy of the vaccine will be against variant X. We have decided internationally and nationally to allow this pandemic to go on far longer than it should have. We've had over 600,000 deaths from a virus we can prevent with a pretty, pretty effectively prevent with a 25 cent mask. We chose for the most part not to do it. We've chosen, for the most part, to abandon it, even with low national immunization levels. So we will see variant X. Adenovirus vectored vaccines are basically the same idea, only one step back. In this case, we take an upper respiratory virus. In this case, it's adenovirus uh, serotype 26. 
We take out the E1A gene so that the virus cannot replicate and substitute in it the gene that encodes the S protein. Inject it, gets taken up. In this case, unlike the mRNA vaccines, this gene does enter the nucleus but cannot integrate into the chromosome. It is classified by FDA as a non-replicative, non-integrative viral vector, meaning you can use it in immunocompromised people. Produces an S protein and stimulates immunity. So you've seen the Johnson & Johnson or so-called Janssen vaccine, one dose, a two dose trial called Ensemble 2 is underway. The AstraZeneca vaccine, which in this case is a chimpanzee adenovirus isolated from stool, two doses, pretty reactogenic vaccine. And the Sputnik V, that's not five, it's V, which uses the very interesting idea of priming with AD26 and boosting with AD5. The reason for this is you do see antibody produced with repeated doses against the viral vector itself. The issue, of course, being, is it at all clinically significant? So let's look at the Janssen AD26 vaccine. Now, a key point I want to make that media and lay people do not understand or appreciate, as well as a lot of healthcare providers. Much of what you learned about SARS-CoV-2 in the past year will not be true today and going forward. So you have to follow the data and not be dogmatic of, well, this is what I understand from the past, because that does not tell us about the present and the future. An example, when we talk about point estimates for vaccine efficacy, we now have to say what year, where, and what variants were circulating. Same vaccine. US, where almost all of the virus was the D to G. The Janssen vaccine point estimate for efficacy against severe to critical disease, 86%. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute, but notice we're gonna talk about severe, moderate, asymptomatic, and more critical outcomes. So against severe to critical disease, 86%. In Brazil, where the majority of virus was the P2, 88%. In South Africa, where the majority was the um, uh, B1351 or South African variant, 82%. So we see a little bit of drop. How about against moderate disease? Well, in the US, a drop from 86% to 72. In Brazil, from 88 to 66. What about asymptomatic disease? Drops a little further to 74%, hospitalization 85, but death 100%. That's true with differing numbers for all of our vaccines. One safety issue that's arisen with the Janssen vaccine is thrombotic thrombocytopenic uh, syndrome. So at the time of this study, there were roughly 9 million doses given, 28 confirmed cases. Of course, there are more than that. Those are the ones we know about for an incidence of about one in 300,000. This is occurring in people, by definition, since it's only licensed for 18 and above, people 18 to less than 60 years old. A range of three to 15 days, a mean of nine days, a marked female preponderance, majority having cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, and the majority having quite profound thrombocytopenia. Highest risk appears to be in women 18 to 49. Now that mechanism has begun to be understand, understood and involves the measure of anti-platelet factor four antibodies. This is an important assay for you to be familiar with because when positive in a setting like this, despite sometimes profound arterial and venous thromboses, we do not use heparin. <clears throat> the unknowns are the same list as the mRNA vaccine with the addition of will we see any kind of interfering antibody against the ad vector itself. 
What you'll be hearing about in the next month is the Novavax recombinant S protein, protein-based vaccine. The idea here is a recombinant S protein. We're very familiar with this platform. We use it for HPV, HBV, and others with a proprietary matrix M adjuvant. Two doses, three weeks apart, raises neutralizing antibody titers that are over four in human. We don't have trial results quite yet, but we can look at other trials. So the phase three UK trial, where looks like uh, the internet connection. You hear me okay? Yes. Um, okay. For just yeah. a second. You're okay. back. 50% of the circulating virus was the so-called UK or Kent or B117 or alpha variant. It's getting very confusing to keep changing nosology. And the uh, point estimate of vaccine efficacy against symptomatic disease was 89%. Against the original strain, 96. Against the UK strain, 86. How about the phase 2B, Republic of South Africa, where over 90% was the South African variant? Well, vaccine efficacy was 55% in HIV negatives. 35% in HIV positives. Different variants, profound difference in point estimates of vaccine efficacy against symptomatic disease. Other unknowns, as I've mentioned, very little data on people who were excluded from the phase three trials. We're getting more data, particularly with solid organ transplant, you may have seen some of those data coming out of Hopkins. We're uh, just starting a study like this uh, in, at Mayo Jacksonville. And uh, the, the uh, measured antibody levels occur in about 40 to 50% after two doses in people with solid organ transplant. But if you look at their T cell responses, they do quite well overall. And similarly with other drugs that you might imagine would impact immune response. Well, for those of you that understand the reference, welcome to the matrix. We have no choice but to enter into the matrix. And this is composed of a variety of knowns and unknowns. Some of the unknowns, we do not yet understand durability of immunity, the effect of viral variants, the role of T cell immunity. We don't even know the number of infectious viral particles needed to produce symptomatic infection. We have allowed and we are seeing mutational pressure because of partial immunity. And we don't yet have a holistic systems level understanding of vaccine induced immunity. So let's talk about the viral variants. Well, I'll intermittently use different names. As I said, it gets confusing, but the UK Kent B117 is now called the alpha variant. The South African 351, the beta. The Brazil P1, the gamma. The India 617.2, the delta. So I've shown you this once before. Last time we talked, you would have considered it theoretical. Everything on this graph has turned out to be true. So let's take a community that each month has a stable 10,000 infections, all right? The bottom gray line is how many deaths you see per month, about 129 out of those 10,000. Now the red line is modeling what happens if the virus becomes 50% more lethal. The number of deaths goes from 129 to 198. We have not seen a strain yet like this. Instead, let's model what the virus is doing. It's becoming more transmissible. So let's take the alpha strain, the B117, the UK. All of those are the same uh, term. Now you go from 129 or 198 deaths per month to just under 1,000 deaths per month. So what does this look like? You've already seen it. Let me point out 
that in May of 2020, we were at a lower rate of infection than we are right now. We made the same mistake. We said, well, we don't need to distance. We don't need to wear masks, open up the restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. And we had a major second wave in part related to the D to G614 mutant, basically was the dominant virus globally. In fact, when you look globally, by the end of just June of last year, almost all the virus circulating was the D to G mutant. Well, there are a variety of variants. We've talked about alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. We're gonna review each of those. But to give you a pictorial, so the UK or alpha variant, about 50% more transmissible than the original strain, probably does cause more severe disease, but vaccines appear to be very effective against it. The South African variant, again, about 50% more um, transmissible. We're not sure whether it actually causes more severe disease, but the vaccines are less effective. The so-called Brazilian variant, or P1, believed to be more transmissible. Not sure that it causes more severe disease. We don't have great point estimates on vaccine efficacy yet because this is not circulated as widely. The California variants, about 20% more transmissible, at least in the elderly, seems to cause more severe disease, but the vaccines look more effect equally effective. If I could label the India or Delta variant here, it's 50% more transmissible than the UK and South African. So 100% more transmissible, if you will, than the original uh, Washington or Wuhan strain. So the UK alpha has some 23 known mutations. It is now international. A lot of the mutations are either in the S protein or have deletins, including the first appearance of the so-called Nelly mutation. Increase the r naught by about 0.4, making the virus 50 to maybe up to 70% more transmissible. Here's a good example of what I mentioned earlier. What you learned last year is that this really isn't an issue in pediatrics. Well, with this variant, it is, because it is more transmissible, increases the viral load by fourfold or more, increases the risk of hospitalization by about 60%. And now in the US and continental Europe, about 25% of the COVID hospitalizations are now in people under the age of 19. So you'll have to abandon what you thought you learned last year about this. The South African or beta variant, 17 lineage defining mutations. This was the first time we saw this trifecta of the Nelly, Eek, and Karen mutations and a deletant in the N5 superloop. This is important because it changes the conformation of the RBD, allows for higher binding affinity, particularly because of the Karen mutation, escapes two major classes of neutralizing antibody, um, and about 50% of convalescent plasma has no detectable neutralizing activity against this variant. And this represents natural selection of a virus with competitive advantages. The point is this, every time the virus infects somebody, it replicates. Every time it replicates, you induce mutations. Those mutations with selective advantages will be maintained and will be synergistic with others, producing more infectious and eventually very likely more severe variants. The Brazilian gamma, uh, gamma variant, 17 mutations, has this same trifecta that we've seen, significant decreases in neutralizing antibody ability of convalescent plasma. The Delta India variant is now a variant of concern. It, the highest number of cases now outside of India occur in the UK. 
In fact, now in the UK, 91% of their sequences are the Delta variant. It is 50% more transmissible than the Alpha, which was 50% more transmissible than the reference strain. This has now been detected as of this morning in over 60 countries. Interestingly, spontaneously arose the same mutation seen in the California variant. And an E to Q 484 rather than an E to K mutation. This has caused a 10 to 60 fold reduction in neutralizing antibody capability against virus. We're gonna look at how and whether that's clinically significant. Sounds like a scary number. And then the uh, Epsilon variant or so-called California variant causing nasal loads of about twofold higher, about 50% of the sequenced uh, viruses in California. Now this cartoon, you're looking down on the face of that trimeric receptor binding domain. All I want you to get out of this slide is to see that all these mutations, regardless of which variant we're talking about, compared to the reference, are all accumulating in the receptor binding domain. Don't mean to be anthropomorphic here, but the virus is learning how to escape based on this mutational pressure, how to escape vaccine and infection induced immunity. And that will continue until we get very high levels of people immunized or immune. What do we mean by very high? probably north of 70%. I'm going to guess it's going to take 80, 85% and less variant X comes along that kind of blows that estimate out of the water. So when we look at these RBD mutations, the Nelly mutation increases transmissibility by about 50%. The EEC reducing neutralizing ability 10 to 60 fold. The Karen allowing tighter binding of the virus to receptor. So let's look at a summary of the results. I know it's a little hard but I'll, uh, to see this, but I'll talk you through it. We're gonna look on the left-hand side in order at the J&J, &J, Pfizer, and Moderna vaccine. Next row, uh, uh, sorry, column, you see the sample size. You then see the efficacy in preventing clinical COVID. Next column, efficacy in preventing severe COVID. So let's pause there. You see that for the most part, you always have better efficacy in preventing more severe disease. Lesson, these are disease blocking and less good at infection blocking. Next columns, these are now neutralization of sera from those immunized people against the UK variant, the Brazil variant, and the South African variant. And you can read for yourself the decreases in that. So what does the efficacy look like if we look at a point estimate against this um, uh, variant? You'll see 57. That is the point estimate of efficacy against moderate to severe disease. Right next to it, you see 85%. That's the point efficacy against severe COVID and hospitalization. Again, making the point I made earlier. To maybe see it a little clearer, these are neutralizing antibody tests by a certain type of assay against the reference strain. The vaccine induces very high levels of antibody, very effective against the UK variant, pretty effective against the uh, Brazil variant. Now we start to get to these South African variants. And what do you see? More than a two-fold reduction in antibodies, still above the limit of detection. And it depends on whether you see other changes associated with it. Looked at a different way. Let's look at the reference strain here, very high levels of antibody. Those are maintained, whether we're looking at Moderna or Pfizer, at the sort of, what is that, Chartouse or something, uh, uh, alpha variant or UK variant. Pretty dramatic, eight and a half fold reductions in titers when we look at the South African variant. Same with Pfizer vaccine. 
So if we kind of summarize this more qualitatively, we do very well against the UK variant. We do less well against the South African variant. And for the mRNA vaccines, we appear to do quite well against the P1 Brazilian variant. So these are data generated in my laboratory yesterday. What we're doing is we're looking at the frequency of IgG memory B cells, looking at different aspects of the virus. So we're looking at, at on the far left at the S1 Wuhan, the S2 Wuhan, the N-terminal domain, and the RBDs from a variety of different variants. Against the reference strain, and these are per 200, they're normally expressed per million, we develop uh, outstanding, these are four different subjects, outstanding levels of memory B cells to the RBD. We do less well against the alpha and South African and uh, India variants, as well as the Brazil, still pretty high. These are remarkably good. So while they're different and you hear those headlines, they're still very um, appreciable levels of B cell, uh, memory B cells. So the issues with the variants, they're about 50 plus percent more transmissible, likely greater vari virulence. In some cases, we've seen full immune escape from monoclonal antibodies. For the most part, I would say some partial immune escape. Younger people are now bearing the brunt of infection. And I think this is what has escaped virtually everybody's notice. We are now entering into the most dangerous period of the pandemic for people who are not vaccinated. They now face very different variants. Now the advantage is we've learned how to ventilate them. We've learned how to care for them in the hospital, but that's the risk they run in their faulty calculus about whether to get the vaccine or not. There are unresolved issues. What's the durability? What about increasing time interval between doses? Clinical trials down to age six months of age with reduced doses are now taking place. I suspect we only have some preliminary data, but mix and matching will work quite well. As you know, in this country, for all vaccines, we've got about 40% or so of the population that is hesitant or rejects vaccines. This is a major issue in the context of a pandemic. Uh, myself, my, my daughter, who's a, a mental health and trauma specialist, and Allison Matthews from our Center for Innovation, published an article on how humans make decisions under conditions of uncertainty. And we proposed a human-centered design uh, method that we think would help with that for those of you that are interested. I've underlined in red the primary, um, if you will, psychological issue that misleads people. Why, why are people irrational in their decision ma making? It's because they come to beliefs first and explanations follow that, i.e. the data don't change their mind. That's why you see people getting vaccines uh, in the state of Washington when they get a free joint, in Minnesota when they get a free fishing license. It never had, and their hesitancy never had anything to do with the science. Well, George Bernard Shaw said, we learn from history that men never learn anything from history. And so too with this pandemic. I've listed up top the pandemics I've lived through thus far and those near or if you will, aborted pandemics that didn't really occur. So durability of protection. Here's the theoretical construct based on what we know so far. For those of you that hear things like, well, I got naturally infected, I'm fine. Well, let's look at the data. The data suggests your immunity at least antibody immunity, will wane faster than otherwise healthy people who got the vaccine. Why would that be? Because the immune response is concentrated on a single antigen. So the depth of that immune response is profound, as opposed to our immune system, if you will, 
being distracted by irrelevant virally presented proteins that don't protect. Now let's look at actual data. Does that turn out to be true? Below you see people who got naturally infected. Above you see people who got vaccine and the decay half-life through day 115 was 58 days for these guys, 65 days for the vaccinated people. But there are also, this is not quite linear. There are different waning half-lives as you go out further and further. So the half-life out to day 240 appears to be closer to 108 days. Remember that number because this is going to be used now in the models that I'm going to show you. Before I do that, I do want to just expose you to this. These are six patients, the original virus, the UK virus, the um, uh, uh, 351 variant, and the Brazil variant. And each of them are organized the same way, after infection, before vaccination, and after vaccination. And you see in all cases, particularly when we're looking at the South African variant down here in the left corner, they wane pretty quickly, but do really well. Notice the level, not as well as against these more reference type strains, a titer of 1600 versus 9,000, but they do respond with very high levels of antibody. This is why the recommendation that we still immunize even after infection. All right, the theoretical construct upon which we as vaccinologists think about that is that we get immunized, you build immunity pretty quickly that wanes. So if it's the same virus, you can boost that again with a booster dose that wanes until you get to the point where you have viral variants where you now have to refocus immunity by giving, if you will, a booster against a variant in order to stay above the level of protection. So what does this look like? So on the x-axis, the mean neutralization level, on the y-axis, protective efficacy. For those of you that got the Moderna vaccine, you just eased out those that got Novavax or the Pfizer. They're pretty equivalent, I'm kind of joking, but different than, um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and other uh, ad-vectored vaccines. So what does that mean? Well, the, again, using this half-life of 108 days over the first 250 days, <clears throat> take the vaccines that most of us got, which were the mRNA-based vaccines. You started at a, a point estimate of vaccine efficacy of about 95%. What we expect is that this is gonna reduce down to, I don't know, high 80s or so over about 250 days. If you have a healthy immune system, I will be shocked unless a new variant arises that you will need a booster in the first year. It might be in year two or three, we don't know yet. That's an extrapolation past any data that we have. But let's say that you got an advectored vaccine and you started out at 70%. Well, you're now getting down to you know, high 30 efficacy, and that may be a problem. Let's look at it a different way. Here's the efficacy against wild type on the x-axis. Here's predicted efficacy against the variant. Remember I told you that at least when we look at the South African variant, we're seeing six to 10-fold decreases in neutralization capability. So the blue and the purple line. So you started off at 90, well, against that South African variant, if I can get my pointer to work, you might be more like at 35, 40 as time goes on. So at least theoretically, considering only antibody, and I've already told you the faulty immunologic logic in thinking that way, is that there is the theoretical need for boosters. Now, if we look against symptomatic disease versus severe disease, you see again in the mRNA vaccines, even though you might see breakthrough mild or moderate disease, 
Look at the efficacy against severe disease. You're still almost up at 100%. That's an important thing to think about as we devise public health strategy. Now, this is a little more complicated, but the basic idea here is the blue dashed line is decay of neutralization over one year, the purple one and a half years, the red two years. The purple shaded region is where you fall below 50% protective titer for symptomatic disease. The orange is where you fall below the 50% protective titer for severe disease. Again, looking at the titers that the mRNA vaccines are raising, you see that you don't even fall into the potential for symptomatic disease until we're talking about 500 plus to 750 out to 1,000 days. So for otherwise healthy people, and this is the problem with public health, recommendations is that they are not individualized. For otherwise healthy people, I will be quite surprised, holding out the difference that a new variant could make, that we would need boosters in the first couple of years. Not true for people who got less effective vaccines or who don't have healthy immune systems. So this is a, a qualitative way of showing you that. This is before and after columns. So a vaccine that prevents disease, but not infection. You see that what happens after you vaccinate is that you are now moving more and more of any, let's call them breakthrough infections, into the asymptomatic or mild range. And that's generally what these vaccines are doing. For vaccines that prevent disease and infection, you see that, uh, and that would be the ultimate for every vaccinologist, you see that you move essentially everything after vaccination into asymptomatic and mild. Um, for some of the variants, like South Africa, we're up here. For the reference and alpha variant, we're down here. For those of you that are interested, we published a state-of-the-art review out of my lab on SARS-CoV-2 immunity and also a review on the role of host genetics, which turn out to play an important role in susceptibility and severity of COVID. So critical points in summary, no surprise, viruses evolve and RNA viruses mutate. They will continue to do so. We are not going to wake up one morning and find this has disappeared. We must use genetic sequencing as a tool to understand strain evolution and diversity. And we have to do so before and after vaccine campaigns. Reduced efficacy does not mean no efficacy or even less public health benefit. Don't let the he headlines scare you. And the proviso that immunity is not solely antibody centric. T cells are important and will play an important role here. So I'll end the way I began with a quote. Everybody knows that pestilences have a way of recurring in the world, and yet somehow we still find it hard to believe in ones that crash down on our heads from a blue sky. Reality is, colleagues, there have been as many plagues as wars in history, yet always plagues and wars take people equally by surprise. I will submit to you I did this in 2005, and I hope this is being taped because in uh, 2025 or 2030, we will drag this out. Two or three years from now, we will lapse back into denial. We likely will not be prepared as a nation, and many medical centers will not be prepared, just as we were not for SARS-CoV-1, for MERS, for SARS-CoV-2 even though we had been warned. And with that, I will end, and I think we've got plenty of time for questions. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Pullen. You do such an exceptional job of making, in my opinion, complicated things seem very simple. So thank you for breaking it down in the way you did. Um, we do have several questions. Um, so I will try maybe to start with a couple that I got messaged from people who are listening. Um, 
So one question says, it appears that vaccine efficacy was about 35% in the HIV positive population. Are there lessons we can take from this in regards to our cancer patients who may be on B cell suppression, such as rituxan or daratumumab um, type therapies? Yeah, the B cell depleting therapies, the anti-metabolites, those are those are the ones that are most going to interfere. Um, and some that you might think of, particularly used, uh, for example, in MS, uh, surprisingly, even though they do have downstream negative signaling effects, nonetheless, people do very well with the vaccine in developing immunity. So, you know, we, we don't have enough research yet. Personal opinion, going against the FDA here, personal opinion. I think there are some individuals in which it's valid to measure an anti-RBD IgG antibody in order to give some guidance. Proviso, don't know what level is protective. Early models suggest as low as one to 50, and these are raising antibody levels in the thousands. So somebody that has a low level but protective level of antibody is gonna do well. Yeah. Um, so maybe a follow-up question to that, since we've been advised via email that, that it's not appropriate to standardly just check everybody, but many of our cancer patients, particularly those on recent therapy, are curious to know if they have antibodies. Yeah. Um, I, I personally have said, go ahead, yep, we'll check that if you want when you come in, but I don't know how to interpret that information for them in regards to, are you protected? What if your lymphocyte count is 100? Does that mean you have partial protection? Um, and do you think that there will be a way for us to assess T cell response in order to try to answer those questions for some of our patients? Yes, I mean, I do thousands of T and B cell LE spots a year in my lab. There are some T cell assays that are sitting before the FDA right now so that we may be able to offer that as a clinical assay in the future. I agree with you. I've done the same thing for patients of mine. I always tell them the provisos. Um, you know, if you have a level in the thousands, you're, you're protected for all intents and purposes. I don't know what a level of 200 means. I suspect I know, but I can't say that, that you're protected. I don't have a way to measure B and T cell memory responses, but the accumulating evidence is that they are there and they are gonna be helpful. So I think when you get very high levels of antibody, you can be reassuring to a patient. The problem is with the in-between levels of antibody. Yeah. So there's a question here um, that asks, do we have any evidence that people who had COVID and then got vaccinated have greater or longer immunity than somebody who never had COVID but just got vaccinated? Yeah, probably the best immunity is people who had disease, survived it, and then got immunized. They have both broad and very focused and deep immune responses. That would make sense. Yeah. Um, there is another question about pediatrics. Um, so can you provide any updates on vaccine studies for younger kids and when they may be available? Um, what group do you think is gonna be the next one approved based on those studies? So um, both Moderna and Pfizer have already asked for approval for five to 11 year olds. Um, they're using a 10 microgram dose of the Pfizer rather than 30. For people in the uh, six month to four month old, just by contrast, they're using a three microgram dose. The hope is that for school age children, the EUA will be granted before school starts in the fall so that we'll be able to immunize. And that's gonna be a major lift in education because of faulty memory, if you will, I don't mean immunologically, of what people thought they learned last year with the reference and alpha variant versus the currently circulating variants. And a quick question here, is Mayo doing any sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 infections among our patients that are coming in now to determine if they have variants that you discussed? That's a good question. Um, and, and it'd be best to ask lab medicine about that. I certainly know that we send sequences to the public health department. I don't know if any of the sites are doing on-site sequencing outside of research for clinical purposes. I don't know. Okay. Um, 
here's a question that got messaged to me as well. Um, the data you presented starting efficacy and half-life of about 108 days would suggest that an, an mRNA vaccine would be better than an adenovirus vectored vaccine, everything else considered equal. Is that an accurate interpretation? Um, with, it, without you know trying to claim favorites, I, I would say yes, when we're looking at mild to moderate disease. All of the vaccines under EUA in the US are extraordinarily effective against death and severe disease. Gotcha. Um, does a drop in antibodies necessarily mean lower immunity or does the immune system just stop the high level production but can be rapidly reactivated if needed? The, the questioner, both parts of the questioner's uh, uh, issues are correct. So waning immunity does not necessarily um, mean that you're not protected. Again, because of memory B and T cells, we see that all the time. Uh, it's, it's why we use, uh, why we don't keep boosting for smallpox, for measles, et, et cetera. Um, so, so that's why I say, don't be scared by the headlines and by pharma CEOs saying, we're gonna be giving boosters next year. I, I don't see that at all unless we get widespread, for example, uh, Delta variant or um, the, the South African variant. Um, there was a second part of that. Um, um, if, can, like, if, those, if those antibody levels drop, basically. Um, oh, can they be boosted? Yes, they definitely can be boosted either by the same vaccine or a variant focused vaccine. Okay. Um, there's a question here from one of our infectious disease colleagues. Um, if the patient had, if a patient in India had COVID and got the AstraZeneca vaccine, then came to the U.S., would there be a role for them getting an alternative vaccine here? Probably not. I know from many of you emailing me, and of course, you know, Mayo is an international destination medical center. We are seeing more of these. Uh, Sinovac, the Russian vaccine, the AZ vaccine. And so, you know, I'm, I'm happy to take emails about that, uh, about individual cases and try to help you think through that. But in that particular case, I think, you know, you, you don't want to expose anybody to the India, India variant, but an India variant followed by, an, by a reference variant vaccine is probably the best immunity you can develop if you survive the disease. There you go. In, given that there are still a number of people who are very hesitant to get the vaccine, um, what do you think we need to do to encourage more Americans to consider it? I, I think one of those groups that we still have a lot of resistance from are the people who already had COVID, right? And they're like, I prefer my natural immunity. I don't think I, don't think I want the vaccine. So how yeah. do you think we can go about convincing some of those people that there would be utility and added protection to them? Uh, that's a really tough question. I'll try to cover it first. Um, information and education always help, even though the data show it's not very helpful. Um, we're learning that incentives may be helpful. And then we're learning about irrational human decision-making. One of them is the uh, uh, presupposition of a democratization of expert knowledge. People who say that are simply ignorant. They don't know. Um, and so that is why medical centers have had to make vaccines mandatory. Personal opinion is that these vaccines, when they are under BLA, not EUA, should be mandatory. I think we have a moral duty to protect our vulnerable patients against diseases for which we have safe and effective vaccines. Makes sense. I, we're right at nine, but if you have time for one more question. I'll I think stay as long as you will have me. Okay. Um, so this comment says, I understand that for those with natural immunity, that neutralizing antibodies may wane. However, bone marrow plasma cells show persistent antibodies long-term. Large-scale epidemiologic data has shown worldwide that reinfection is extremely rare for prior infected patients, backing up that they may have long-lived humoral immune response has similar research on bone marrow plasma cells been done in vaccinated patients? It's just started. The questioner is exactly right. There was a study looking at long-lived uh, uh, plasma B cells in people previously infected. 
re remember, I mean, that we all want a lot of data. We've been dealing with this for less than two years. The world has been on fire and we've been flying the airplane, uh, you know, while we build it. So that's a, that's a research question that absolutely deserves to be answered. And there are ongoing studies looking at that. I don't have data on the vaccinated part yet. Okay, good answer. Well, I wanna thank you again for your time, expertise and everything you shared with us today. I certainly feel like I have a better understanding of where we stand uh, and the impact that the variants may have. It's hard to follow even trying to read about stuff when I they know. keep changing the names of them. So thank you for summarizing you know, that. That's the, that's the great beauty of Mayo Clinic. You know, things that are routine to you, Allison, I can't follow that literature and I have to ask you. And I, I really appreciate that about my colleagues as we freely consult with one another by email, phone, and I'm happy to, to do my part in that. I spend all day on COVID. Uh, you can't expect everybody to do that. So I'll just reiterate something that Dr. Poland said earlier. If there are specific questions um, that you didn't get answered today as part of this, he accepts emails and would be happy to do his best to address your questions. Um, and as things evolve, we may have an opportunity to bring you back. So thank you That'd again for your time and, All right. and to everyone who joined us today. Be safe and vaccinated. See you, Dr. Poland. Thank you. Bye-bye.